Hello guys, welcome to our new Instagram Live. Today we're gonna to be talking with one of our six dolls, six doll six, and we'll be talking about her BBL experience from the very beginning until later on through her recovery, what she did um, on top of the surgery. Remember, surgery is just a part of it. Recovery is equally important and she's done an amazing job with her recovery. How are you? I'm good, how are you? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Thanks for um, sharing your experience with our followers. You're one of our BBL patients. You had your surgery, what was it, July of last year? So yes, it's almost July year. 31st, yeah. July 31st. Amazing, amazing. And you've done an amazing job with document everything, putting pictures and sharing your thoughts and your experiences with your followers. So it's been a great thing for other women to sort of follow you and watch you and learn from your experiences. Get you to share with us from a patient's perspective, from your perspective, what was it like going through the whole process um, from the beginning up until now? So let's start with the very, very beginning. What made you decide to get a BBL? Well... I've always wanted a more um, curvy shape, and I was um, I was in the gym quite a lot. I was trying to, you know, get a shape that I just it wasn't realistic to get in the gym. I just felt like I wasn't in my own body, and no matter what I did, I ate super well. I exercised a lot, and the fat would not budge. So two years of that, of constantly feeling like I'm just not myself. Like I did not feel like myself. I did not like um, wearing tight clothes. I felt like I was just kind of myself was disappearing, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I just decided to do something about it. And I was like, I'm not going to I'm not going to stay unhappy for the rest of my life. That's not going to happen. And I've been working at it and nothing's working. So that's what made me decide to get a BBL. Um, why would it be BBL? Why not just liposuction? Why not just go and get a lipo? Um, so what made you go to the next step of doing lipo and then do the fat transfer? Because I figured since since we're not, since that fat's getting removed, let's let's put it in the booty. <laughs> so that's a nice thing about BBLs is that it's not really just getting rid of the fat, but you know you take fat from areas where you don't want it and put mm -hmm. it to where you do. So butt is the most common one. The other common one that people always talk about is also breasts. Now, breasts are different. It is not the same thing, and it will be a completely separate discussion. If you guys have questions about fat transfer to breasts, you can ask me separately. We won't go into it in this IG Live. We'll just talk about the butt, but that is also a possibility. It's transferring fat to the breast. But we'll, we'll stay with the butt itself. So you decided that instead of just getting rid of all the fat and throwing it out, you're going to transfer it to the thumb. Yes. How did you know there's such a thing as a BBL? Oh man, the Kardashians. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, bad question. The Kardashians. Yeah. Uh, lots of Instagram models suddenly becoming very curvy. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to take this moment to say thank you to Kim for referring all the patients to us. Our clinic would not be the same without Kardashians. Thank you. <laughs> so let's talk about the next step. So then you decide you want to go ahead and have <laughs> and you've done your research. Where did you look at your research? Oh man, I spent I spent a whole year before actually, you know, booking a consult. I spent a whole year researching. Um, I researched doctors. I researched proper post-op care. I was in so many BBL Facebook groups. Um, I was going through pages of Google just to get the appropriate information. And I like I feel like it's a big surgery. It's a big thing. It's not something that you just decide to do in two seconds, which unfortunately I see a lot of people actually do. And then let's try and drop right there. BBLs have a reputation for dangerous, and they certainly are. Realize this is not a joke. This is a real surgery. You should do your research uh, because BBLs have a high risk of something called fat embolism, and it's a serious complication, potentially fatal complication. So it's it's not like going to uh, you know get. It's a serious thing. You should do your research. So go on. Yeah, it's a, a really, really big surgery and a very long recovery. So mm -hmm. that's what I, I always get, like, uh, messages like, oh, I just got my BBL. Oh, in two weeks, can I go drinking and partying? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm not sure how many consultations you've had, but what made you or helped you zero in on the surgeon or the clinic that you were sort of looking at? Um, well, I was looking at pretty much everywhere, and I've noticed that 
yes, there's some good doctors that will suck you dry. But I wanted the smoothest results. Mm -hmm. Smooth, even, like consistent results. And yeah. with a doctor that is safe. And you know what? It was just luck that you were also in Canada, like not far from me. <laughs> so I was just like over the moon happy that I found you. Tell us about the day of surgery. Now, a lot of people that want to go ahead with the surgery are really terrified of the surgery itself and going under. So do you remember the day of surgery? Can you sort of walk us through what happened when you came into the clinic? What, what do you remember from the whole process? Ooh, I was so excited. I was so excited. I trust your team 100%. I've seen the reviews. I've seen the patient testimonies. I was like, let's go. Let's get this done. Some, some people are super, super eager. Most people are a little bit anxious. Like most people, even if they're not yeah. anxious, they come in, they're excited to go. But the moment I walk in, I start taking pictures and do my pre-op markings, they get a little anxious. And the thing that pretty much everybody says is they're afraid of going under. They're not, they're not afraid of the surgery. They're afraid of going under. Was that your case where you were concerned about going under? Just slightly, but I really trusted your team. I mean, if you do the appropriate research on your doctor and you know that he's obviously board certified and 100% safe, you, got, you, need, you need to do your research. So pe people are scared of going under and um, so sometimes people want to see if the surgery can be done under local anesthesia. People under local anesthesia is probably not a good option. It's too much like it's too big. And don't be scared of going under. Uh, doing procedures under conscious sedation or under a lot of local can also be dangerous. They, they, they're not danger free. So general versus local versus conscious sedation, IV sedation, they all have pros and cons. Now going back to general anesthesia, which is what we do for our BPL patients, people are scared. They're scared of not waking up. They're scared of anesthesia. But can you, can you recall to describe the whole process? Do you remember falling asleep? And what do you remember about it? And what do you remember about waking up? Oh, yeah, I remember her putting in the, the whatever she put in. And then she told me to count backwards. And I did two numbers and I was I was gone. <laughs> it was so fast. It's, it's, and then it's, I a pretty, yeah, it's, it's a pretty fast process. People often ask me, how, how long is a surgery? And my answer always is five seconds. For you, it's five seconds. You're going to close your eyes. Next thing you know, you're going to wake up. But then when you wake up, what, what do you remember from waking up? What are you uncomfortable? Oh my God. Did you get a lot of pain? What happened there? I woke up like I had the best, the best sleep of my life. That's how I woke up. I woke up so refreshed. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I woke up like uh, I couldn't stop laughing. I don't know why I could stop laughing, but I could not stop laughing. I could hear the nurses talk about ordering Chinese food. And I was like, oh, my God, I'd kill for Chinese food. I was so not worried about pain or anything. I was in no pain. I was just like, just going on my normal day. Like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And then what happened afterwards after you woke up? After I woke up, I think she checked, she checked if I, if I was okay. And then they wanted, they were, they were checking to see if I could stand and I could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they told me to sit down in the chair because I was, was a little drowsy, but I, I was totally feeling good. Tell us about the pain after surgery. How was your pain? I think the pain started to kick in really when those, those pain meds kind of wore off. And it's, How long after surgery was that? Uh, maybe like 12 hours. So when we do the uh, butt lifts, um, we give, a lot of, we give our patient a lot, of, a lot of pain medication, kind of stays on board, and the anesthetic stays on board. So depends on how long, you know, everybody's a little bit different. For some people, it wears off quicker. For some people, it can be a shorter time. But after the, the numbing wears off, we give all our patients pain medications, Percocet, Stan, all threes. When do you start taking the pills? When I started feeling the pain. But I tried not to take too many Percocets. Okay. I think I took it like twice and then after I switched to Tylenol. Yeah. Everybody's got but, a different pain threshold. So people often ask us, you know, how much pain you have. They ask other patients who had, pain, uh, who had the surgery and some of them will say, well, you know, I was good after two days. Some people will say I was in a lot of pain for two weeks. Everybody's a little bit different. Pain threshold is a little bit different. Um, in general, most people are pretty comfortable. Um, I'm not sure if this was your case, but typically the first 48 hours are the worst when you have most pain. But this is not the kind of pain that keeps you in bed. You can't get up. It's just it's very uncomfortable, and you have yeah. to take medication every You feel just hours, very regularly. sore all over, like, just like, ugh. 
when did you stop taking your pain medication? Mm, I stopped pretty quick because I have a really high pain tolerance. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it just felt like I was sore from like a big workout. I think four days. Four days? Okay. Yeah. Um, so after the surgery is over, you, first night you stayed overnight. We saw you the next morning, then you left. And then we had you come back at about one week. But typically for Brazilian Butler patients, I want to stay in touch with our patients every single day. So if you have a BIA with us, I want you to be in touch with our nursing team. Yeah, there's, you guys get a, a nursing phone number or email. And every day update us how you're feeling. I'm looking out for signs of infection, fever, chill, night sweats. We want you to measure your temperature every single day. I want to be on top of it. That's my number one concern to BBLs. Mm -hmm. The risk of infection um, goes away after two weeks. If after two weeks you had no infection, then then you touch done. I'm happy. But during those first two weeks, guys, if you're having a BBL with us, please don't disappear. We want to hear from you every single day and just know what's going on. Did we do the same with you? Oh yeah, you guys were on it. I yeah. love the nurses. Honestly, it was yeah. it was a great experience. <laughs> we, we we want to stay in touch. Um, <laughs> You know, like it's it's not like surgery is done and we kick you out and never see you again. We we stay mm -hmm. that and with you we we stay in touch. It's almost a year now. We're gonna see our patients for up to a year after surgery. Now, what I want to get into next, and the reason why I wanted to do this IG live with you is because you've done an amazing job looking after yourself after surgery, and this is a really important point I want to make right here. As a surgeon, I do my part. I do the surgery, but after surgery, the recovery is important. And in liposuction cases. The recovery is 50% of the result. So I do 50% and you do 50%. The, the 50% that patients do is proper garments, proper massage, and staying healthy and taking care of themselves. And in your situation, you've done an amazing job in massaging yourself, getting all the files and everything. So I would love for you to share with us the steps that went into what you did, how you did, and how, how you did this. Because honestly, I think one of the reasons why you have such an amazing result is because you've taken an amazing care of yourself after surgery. So please share with us what happened. Thank you. Done. Thank you. Wow. Um, well, I, from the beginning, I've always, for anything that I do, I like to research, research, research. That's just the kind of person that I am. So it was kind of a bit of trial and error because I didn't really have like, I don't really know what I was doing at the beginning. That's basically it. <laughs> okay. So you knew it's your first time getting a BBL. Yeah. How did you figure out if you want to get a Faha? How did you get your Faha and the massages and, and took all those? Because we do offer um, massages to our patients in our clinic, but you're from out of town. So you end up finding somebody closer to you, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I, I found Contour Fajas. And I contacted the representative, Shannon, you know her, mm -hmm. she's amazing. And she actually came to me, I think, uh, like, four or five days post op, and she measured me. And so that I got fitted for that was my stage two that I got fitted for. But before I, I had bought some Fajas for stage one. So mm -hmm. that has like softer material, it's like, not as compressing as the stage two. But uh, I learned a lot from um, this certain group on Facebook uh, that's run by Time Out, uh, Time Out Massage. She's okay. honestly, absolutely, you should check her out. She's really amazing um, with her massage techniques. And she just is filled with information and wisdom about surgery and BBLs, liposuction, anything like that. So mm -hmm. I, I was really just following her guidance. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to massages, tell us about your massage routine. What, what was it like you know, from early on after surgery and how it progressed up until today? Are you still getting massages, by the way? No, I am not getting massages, but that's because it's been, it's been, uh, it's been very chaotic here. <laughs> You're probably stuck at home with all the quarantine stuff oh, as well, right? Yeah, that too. That doesn't that help. <laughs> but, um, but, but up until now, you were still getting massages, correct? And this is up like until five months, up until five months, I was getting massages, yeah. Yeah, so five months after surgery. Yes. So it's important to know, massages help shape the body and smooth things out. And people develop fibrosis. Fibrosis happens after every liposuction. It is a, it's body's natural response to the injury. When you have an injury or a surgical cut, but it's a surgical injury, your body creates scar tissue. Your body de deposits collagen all over, which is the, the proliferative phase, but it's piling up lots and lots of collagen fibers, and then the collagen fibers tend to clump up, 
And as they do, they become little lumps and bumps and you have to massage to smooth them out to get nice smooth results. So please, please tell us about your massages. How, 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 Ooh. How, <laughs> how were they? they? Right, how were they initially after surgery and how it progressed over time? Okay, well, I got my massages at Bella Body. They're in Scarborough. They're absolutely amazing. And she actually planned out the schedule of things that I should do before surgery and after surgery. So I was really thankful for her for that because I, I felt like organized, like I knew what I was doing. And the first massage, you definitely, first of all, the first massage, you want to go with the full stomach. You don't want to go there like you didn't eat. Why is that? Um, because a lot of people faint. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and you want to bring a bottle of Gatorade for electrolytes for that weak feeling. So I had done all of that. And then I got on the table. And then she just slightly touched me. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> this is not going to be good. And it was rough. I have a very high pain tolerance and it was rough. I was holding back tears, but it gets better. And this is necessary because after each massage that I got, I felt so much better. I felt like the swelling had decreased. I felt like my pain had decreased. So massages are so important. Aside from making you look better, they also make you feel better. They yes. Feel the swelling, they, they sort of help you get on top of the pain because right after surgery your skin is hyper hypersensitive just like everything hurts like crazy so the more you touch it it's like a sensitization the more you touch the more you massage the more exactly the pain so, it was rough but it gets better guys <laughs> that's, that's, uh, like i tell my patients you know when you start out if you don't have tears in your eyes you're not doing it right so just gentle little touch it's not gonna do much um did yeah you do it on massage as well or did you just always go for a professional massage I did home massages too on myself in between massages and I would use, I would actually use the, this machine, this, uh, it's called the wall hot and cold massager. And it was okay. actually really good for, you know, the lumps and bumps. So in okay. between massages, that thing is amazing. You could get it on Amazon. Super good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. So that was the early part. And then sometimes people do the massage for one month or so and they, they kind of forget, let it go. What made you continue and keep doing this for such a long time honestly i just love the results i love the feeling of after um hyperbaric chambers they're amazing yeah. before yeah. surgery and after yeah. definitely so, i think it played a big part in my recovery too um i do recommend that patients do seek a hyperbaric chamber i do the a few recommendations around town um, there's no scientific evidence to say that it's gonna improve fat survival more than just the fat survival patients tell me that they feel like a million bucks after coming out uh, you see bruising go away faster they they regain their energy and feel like themselves quicker so i, I would describe going to have a great oxygen chambers as almost like doping your recovery you just like push yourself beyond the regular stations that's really recover fast fast, mm -hmm. fast. It, it, it's a great uh, great little extra uh, it is not something we offer in our clinic. Uh, you would have to go outside to one of the other facilities and they do charge you some money for it, but I think it's money well spent. Uh, oh, definitely. Recovery. You get swollen absolutely everywhere after surgery, not just your yeah. stomach or wherever you got lipo. You get swollen everywhere. My feet were huge the first week. I had a huge baby feet. Did you gain any weight? <laughs> uh, did I gain I. I didn't, I didn't get on the scale, but it was probably all like uh, fluid, I'm yeah, guessing. So people, people do gain weight. Sometimes they ask like, what happened? Why am I like 10 pounds here? It's all water weight. It's all the swelling and it does go away over time. But initially, yes, you will be swollen. It's all the fluids, just the response to having surgery. People do swell, so that is perfectly normal. I have a lot of people asking me like, it's okay to be bloated. Like it's okay to be swollen. Like that's, that's the journey. Your, yeah. your waist is going to shrink by itself. You just got to wait. You just got to keep drinking your water, keep compressing, just keep doing what you're doing. You, you've transformed a lot from the initial post op fix up until now. Uh, was it a slow process? What, were there, were there like certain specific times when you like notice a sudden dramatic change or was it just like a slow, gradual progression to where you are today? Oh, at around three weeks, it's like all the swelling just suddenly disappeared. It was very... 
is it is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, I my abs started to come in, and I didn't even know I had abs, so that was a surprise. And around week, uh, around like three, four months, that's when really everything's starting to come together. So that's why I tell everyone, just don't look at your body before three, four months. So let's move on to the next topic, which is the fat house. The so well, I would call it like shape, right? And I still, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I put compression garments on our patients and the purpose of the compression garment right after surgery is to minimize swelling and bruising and kind of mm -hmm. smooth out. The fahas then over time also help to shape your body. So can you tell us more about your faha experience? Oof, I went through so many fahas just to find the right one. Um, well, the first stage, the first stage of fahas is stage one, and it needs to be soft and obviously bigger. Mm -hmm. And I actually I measured my hips and I went up a size, and it fit me absolutely perfectly. So I think people should do that. But um, the second stage is much tighter. It's much tighter. It's uncomfortable. You're going to be uncomfortable throughout this whole journey. It's, you're not going to be comfortable. Where do you feel the pain? Um, I felt a lot of pain on my sides and on my stomach. But I mm -hmm. think that's the nerves reconnecting. Yeah. So after surgery, uh, the nerves have been injured. And as they heal, they start to fire randomly, they're hypersensitive, so you will have all kinds of needles, electroshocks, itchiness, uh, cold intolerance, heat intolerance, all kinds of different sensations, and you're going to be in some of this stuff, but it, it's all perfectly fine. Now, sometimes it can be too much, or it's not going away fast enough, so speak to your doctor. There's many kids we can give you to help numb the what's so-called nerve pain. But going back to your faha, um, how tight... Do you, do you feel in it? Like, how tight should it be? What, what should people expect? It shouldn't be tight that you're having difficulty breathing. It should be tight like you can move around. Mm -hmm. Like, it should feel not snug, but a little tighter than snug. So you need to be able to move around in it, basically. But it's, it shouldn't be cutting off your breathing because that's dangerous. <laughs> And sometimes there's, there is such thing as over-compressing, which is a mistake that I did at the beginning. I did too much too fast. And my massage therapist, queen of body sculpting, um, she, she told me, you're doing too much and it's, it's going to slow down your healing. You're doing damage to yourself right now. And she noticed it because my stomach was so much darker than the rest of my body, which was basically a sign of lack of oxygen. Um, so what can happen is, you, yeah, you have to be careful. If you wear a compression garment too tight, it can create indents in your skin that can become permanent. It also create pressure sores. Uh, people refer to them as faha burns. It looks like a burn. Mm -hmm. So you have pressure sore for too much compression, but there's too much pressure that is blood supply is not able to get into the skin and then skin dies and it looks like a burn. So be careful. You should have some type of, but if you're uncomfortable, ask somebody or take it up. You should not be in too much discomfort after putting a faha on. And always wear a tank top under, especially at the beginning, because yeah, it's, gonna, it's gonna help. For padding, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one common um, complaint I've heard from a lot of people is they feel like their fast tend to be very, very tight on the side. Did you feel like your sides, your sort of lateral thighs, lateral butt was being compressed too much? Uh, not my butt, but mm -hmm. my sides, yes. And I actually bought something to help with it, because you, you can, there's so many accessories out there. You can, okay. they're called lateral protectors and you, they're like little foam pads and you can literally put them on your, on your sides so that it, it helps with the pain. But if you add a foam pad, you're adding extra layers so it'll be more, mm -hmm. wouldn't you feel even tighter after that? Yeah, it does feel a, a bit more tight, but it's less painful than the like, the, the Faha, um, Oh my God, the Faha fabric on you. So I got, I got a few more questions sort of to finish off. One of them is, why do you think, or what, what is the secret sauce in this whole process that helped you get this amazing result that you have? What do you, what do you think was the, the secret that- Definitely you, combination uh, of obviously doctor and proper post-op care. Definitely mm -hmm. invest in your post-op care. A lot mm -hmm. of people think that you know, I'm going to have this surgery and then I'm going to have a few massages and that's it. No. 
keep going because you're only fully year to, you're only fully healed at a year so just exactly. keep going it's it's a process it takes a while you gotta be patient yeah it takes so much patience and you go through a roller coaster of emotions perfect segue because my next question was about emotions <laughs> um pretty much every patient that goes to surgery goes to the roller coaster of emotions up and down up and down and it starts right after surgery um i don't know what is what it is the concoction of drugs that the anesthetists give to patients but some patients wake up super happy and loving me and excited and some patients wake up uncontrollably cry they just can't help themselves they just can't stop crying and then people go through ups and downs. They feel amazing after the surgery, and the next day they feel crappy. They feel like, what am I done? This is horrible. Why have I gone through this? And it's an up and down, up and down. Uh, as they're recovering, they're like, oh, I have this, I have that. And people have insecurities. Let's talk about you. Like, I think most people that follow you will say, you look absolutely phenomenal. You are flawless. And yet I know there are some things that you feel insecure about, and you, you posted about this on Instagram saying, you know, there was something that you just were not happy about. Can you can you talk about that? I think I think we all go through this whole thing. Once you get something fixed, you kind of just nitpick at everything, and I, that's what I was doing. And I was going through that emotion of roller coasters, um, especially especially around like three three weeks around three weeks, mm -hmm. because I mean you're sore can't do much <laughs> you're just filled with padding so you look like a michelin man so yeah you're gonna feel fat and yeah you're gonna feel depressed but under it it looks good it's just you can't see it so that's why you feel so depressed but um yeah i i guess a lot of people after surgery once they fix something they start to nitpick at other things and they want to perfect other things and Surgery is not for perfection. It's about enhancing what you already had. Exactly. And, and you realize that you're always the biggest critic. You see things other people don't see. Because you stand exactly. in front of and, and, you know, if you stand in front of a mirror and look at something and you see a little imperfection, the longer you stare it, the more it gets growing and growing and becomes humongous. And it, it's really important that you have people around you that are supportive. Because I've seen how... Good support can make all the difference, and bad support can this beautiful results. I've I've had patients that are super happy, and then months after, you know, some friend or family member points out, "Hey, what is that?" And suddenly they see some imperfection that just killing them, and they just you know rush to the clinic. They say, "I need a revision. I need a touch up. This is horrible," and I don't see it. I'm like, "That that's that's normal. That's perfect." But in their mind, because of their surroundings and their self become such a big issue. Um, that they just are dying to get in there and get a touch up or revision. So it's, it's important sometimes to step back and say, okay, let's look at the big picture. I look amazing. This is awesome. There's no need for a touch up. And also remember what you started with. Like, it this is, is like such a crazy enhancement. Like, it, it is amazing how people forget. Um, whenever people say they're unhappy with the result, I, pull up their before picture because I know nine of them times they forgot what they look like and then they go that was yeah crazy. wow okay 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 I'm good now I actually have a question for you <laughs> fire away yay um what makes a surgeon decide if they want to use drains or not um when you think the risk of fluid collection is significant so I used to never use drains when I did liposuction, but as I became more aggressive and being more and more like one, creating more of an open space, um, the, the chance of developing a free collection called a stroma goes up. And so I started using drains. If you do a little bit of liposuction and the area that you liposuction then collapses, that's fine. But because of the amount of lipo that we do these days, I leave a lot of empty space underneath the skin. There's a lot of, you know, if, if you see our snaps, I show this sort of honeycomb meshwork, you know, looks like pizza. Sometimes people say it's empty spaces where fat used to be in the see the fibrous tissue. So all this empty space is potential space where fluid can collect. Unless I'm able to compress it with a compression garment, this is going to be empty space that's going to collect fluid. And so mm. you have to leave everything in there. Um, ideally, I wouldn't use drains, but it's it's just impractical to like skin temperature like hell when I'm this. The other reason why I would use drains is if I, I use an ultrasound like a baser, and mm -hmm. if I'm using a plasma. So all of these increase 
increase uh, the risk of serum absolute collections. And so now, you know, pretty much for all my LiPo 360 and BBLs, I always use drains. Oh, that's nice to know. Thanks. <laughs> all right. I was getting so, that question a lot. So I was like, oh, might as well ask uh, the expert okay. himself. <laughs> Now, some people don't use drains. What they do is they leave their incisions open and let people drain. And you see these pictures from, uh, usually from um, down south, Colombia or Dominican. Oh, it looks so brutal. And they're like massaging and squirting. Yeah. Out oh. Perfectly fine, but it's an extremely messy thing. Yes. So it's just to have a drain and collecting a nice little drain. And for our patients especially, all our patients get to stay at the family or your hotel overnight. If I don't put a drain in, it's going to look like a bloodbath you know that that's gonna be a disaster and, and even the with the drain us. you still leak a little so i can't even imagine without it exactly it, it would be a nightmare i actually had a patient a couple of years ago who called me below that saying they're bleeding they're bleeding they're calling 911 they go to, uh, to the emerge i'm like i'm like they're probably not bleeding so i said well security was going out there like i asked security he's probably calm i said can you tell me is there a little blood it's like yeah there's a lot of blood like, oh my god <laughs> I still don't believe it. So paramedics show up. And I'm thinking, okay, these are medical people. So I'm going to ask them, uh, is she really bleeding? And the paramedics like, yeah, there's blood everywhere. All right, all right. So they took her to the eMERGE. I went to the eMERGE to meet her there. I walk in, I look at her, I'm like, where's all the blood? There was no blood. What are you talking about? They checked her blood. There was no blood loss. Um, so they checked the patient. She was perfectly fine. We brought her back. And then we went up and see, see the room. And I, I think I posted this picture on, on Instagram. It's a little bit of blood on, on a pad on the bed. And then she has two red pillows. And because everybody was panicking, they all thought these were blood soaked red pillows. But those were just red pillows. Oh, my God. <laughs> so everybody panicked. The blood loss was actually really minimal. But, yeah, people get scared and, and they think they're getting to death. And, yeah. There's a question about medications, uh, anxiety meds, and what is maybe a case for me. So I guess it's a question of anxiety medication. Guys, if you take medication before surgery, any prescription medication, don't stop taking it. Uh, if you have questions, ask your surgeon. Uh, continue all your pre-op medications. If you have anxiety, do take your anxiety medication right before surgery and sleep. Question about J plasma. All right, that's a great topic. So J plasma is this new technology, which we've had for about a year. Did we use J plasma on you? I, I think yes, we used J plasma. Yes, you did. Yeah. So J plasma is a helium plasma um, that takes helium gas, radio frequency stimulates the, the gas to go from a gas phase to plasma phase. That's a fourth phase. People talk about solid, liquid, and gas, and there's also plasma phase. The plasma creates thermal injury thermal change to collagen fibers to, to constrict them. So it doesn't shrink the skin, it doesn't give you skin tightening, it makes the skin heal closer to deeper layers. So what happens is shortly after surgery, when you pinch yourself, it feels like it's really, really stuck down. Now people ask if this is permanent, it is not, nothing is. If you stay as you are and you don't move, yes, but as you keep you moving your body and your skin and you know, all the layers move, they shear and they move. Um, the way I would explain to somebody is it helps to hold the skin in place for the first few months, then it loosens. And as it goes on, people sometimes feel like the, the effect is gone completely. I, I would describe it as you loosen up, but you're in better shape than if you would be had you not done it. Mm. I don't know. What was your experience like? You, you had J-plasma. How long do you feel like your J-plasma lasted and what did you think about it? I think it, it really, it lasted um between like three and four months and it was really like it was it's crazy it felt like my skin was like super tight mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty cool I've had people, I have people describe it as they felt wrapped like really tight on but then yeah. as you move it will loosen up it will loosen up um how many months would you say you felt like the difference lasted for the four to six months or was it longer yeah four to six months okay did you have any lumps and bumps under your skin that you had to sort of focus on work on? Do you remember? Um, at the beginning, areas? yes. I had, I, like towards uh, my lower abdomen, I had a lot of bumps and okay. my massage therapist just massaged them through and after Do a couple sessions, it? it's completely gone. Do you have any lumps and bumps left behind? Super smooth. <laughs> There's a question about how do we determine where we go for local anesthesia or general anesthesia? Um, 
they both have pros and cons. Uh, whenever you can, you would do local anesthesia, but you can't always do local anesthesia. Local anesthesia means that we freeze something and we inject medication, typically called lidocaine or xylocaine. Like any drug, there's such a thing as a toxic dose. You can have too much. So if you inject too much, trying to cover too big of an area, it can actually be toxic to you. So that is the limiting factor. So if it's a small area, we can freeze it great. If it's a larger area, then I prefer to put you to sleep. Uh, it's simpler, easier, and quicker. Typically, I do BBL under the anesthesia. There are people out there that do BBLs on the local. Um, they don't end up looking good at all because they, they, can't, they can't, you know, do what you can do under general anesthesia. Um, um, yes. Um, it is difficult to make it completely numb. Um, it takes longer. Um, and you, you, you can't be as aggressive. You can't take out as much fat. And, and then injecting to the butt is a little more difficult. So for those reasons, I personally am not a fan of local BBAs. Plus, I can't even imagine being a waiter of my BBL. Oh, my God. There's a question about, is no pain medication common? Um, is it common not to take pain medication afterwards? It's not. Everybody's got a different pain threshold. Uh, I have some patients who stop taking the medication, like the strong painkillers after a day or two. And some people keep asking for refills for weeks. So again, everybody's a little bit different. Um, I find women that had children before and don't do vaginal delivery tend to have a higher pain threshold. People that had previous surgery tend to have a higher pain threshold. Um, and men in general tend to have a much lower pain threshold. <laughs> Question, what is an alternative to narcotics if you can't have narcotics? There's no opioid medication for people that can't take narcotics. Um, I've had a patient who I did a breast reconstruction on and she didn't take anything like zero. So she had absolutely nothing and she just medicated the recovery. I was, I was impressed because breast wow. reconstruction is- That takes is, strength. Yeah, that takes it's, strength. It's a, painful, it's a painful surgery and she did it without it. So mind over matter. Not that I recommend it. it was, that was one patient. I, I would not want to recommend this to anybody. Um, if you have issues with pain medication, you probably have been seeing a doctor about that. Um, maybe um, get a referral to a pain specialist and maybe we can talk about alternatives or we can talk to our anesthesia doctors about alternative medications for pain if opioids are not the way to go for you. Question about fat dying. Um, most of the fat that gets injected does not survive. Uh, just, just the way it is. What percentage of the fat would you say you've retained in your butt? Mm, it's hard because I feel like it, it would be a better question to ask someone that sees me every day. Because okay. like, I can't physically just look back and be like, oh, let me see. Um, I want to say maybe like 35%. I feel like it was, it was like really big before. <laughs> sure. um, right after surgery, your body's going to be huge. All the volume they've injected, all the fat they've injected is there, plus there's going to be a lot of swelling. The swelling, Over yeah. Over the next weeks, you're going to lose what seems like a lot of volume. And this is really the water, the, the swelling. So you're going to lose the swelling. And then over the next three months, the fat that did not survive is slowly going to be extracted from your body. So you're going to wait full three months to see the final results. Typically three months. Some people see results for a longer time. Some people see them like, so they stop changing after about a month. Now, I've had some people message me years after surgery saying that, you know, years after they, they've lost volume in their butt. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, it's probably just with the, the fat distribution. As, as you age, your body fat distribution changes. Typically, it goes from the good places to the bad places, and that may be happening in those patients because I'm not quite sure why years after surgery, someone would suddenly lose volume in their butt. Maybe weight loss. Uh, weight loss is, you know, the, the first thing you think of, but, the, the, you know, sometimes people say, I haven't lost any weight, my, just, my butt just went away. And it's, it's difficult to say, you know, why that is maybe the fat we distributed somewhere else. That being said, fat does not move. Okay, so if sometimes people ask, can my fat move from here to there? So when we do liposuction, fat, so what we do is we take fat cells and move them from one place to the other. These fat cells are the little containers that hold fat. Because fat doesn't flow freely in your body. It's stored in fat cells, and fat cells stay where they are. Now, as you age um, or, or gain or lose weight, fat cells swell up or shrink. They go up and down, but they don't actually move. And as you age, uh, your body, for some reason, this is genetically predetermined, starts to pause in fat, fat cells in one area versus another. So this is how fat distribution changes in the body with aging. Pineapple, 
bromelain uh, and um, yeah i used uh, i had bro bromelain pills i still take them to this day because i still have uh, some swelling yeah, you don't want to be eating or drinking salty things uh, don't go for sushi don't don't have soy sauce something high on salt because so you're gonna you blow up like a balloon exactly <laughs> you're gonna look like michelle <laughs> uh there's a question about how long did you use a bbl pill did you have a bbl pillow i did I did. I started using it. I actually, I used it on my flight going home. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not comfortable. I'm, uh, you got to get used to it because it hurts on your thighs because you're basically sitting on your thighs. I don't know if that makes sense in any way. So okay. you got to get used to it and it's pretty hard. But um, once you get used to it, it's, I actually brought it everywhere. When I, used, when I would go to restaurants and bring my pillow. Had some okay. weird looks, but whatever. Still look good. <laughs> and, and when did you stop using a BBL pillow? When did you start? When did you stop using a BBL pillow? And when did you start actually sitting freely on your bum? Um, I really because I wanted to do this once, and I know some people they they go through numerous rounds because they really want an extreme look. And I was like, I'm doing this once, and that is all. And so I wanted the best possible like chance of fat survival. So I really. I waited for like 12 weeks to not sit. And it was a challenge. Sorry. And I did it. Um, there's a question about Vaser. Vaser is ultrasound, um, ultrasound um, liposuction. It's not ultrasound liposuction. It's ultrasound used for the first step, uh, where ultrasound creates vibrations to break up fat. Uh, I use it. Uh, typically on the thinner patient, I'll have much finer liposuction. People that had previous liposuction, there's fibrotic tissue. Or if I'm going to areas which I know are fibrotic, such as brarols, if I'm going to focus on brarols, uh, VASO really helps because it's very, very fibrotic. And so again, what VASO is, it's ultrasound. It sounds like laser, it's not. It's ultrasound. The ultrasonic vibration creates cavitation, and air bubbles in, in, the, in the tumor sense solution and break up fat. So it's the, the gentler, um, less bloody, smoother kind of a result. Um, does Vaser help you recover faster? Do you have like a faster recovery time with it? Um, on one hand, you could say yes, because there'll be less, there's supposed to be less bleeding, so the less bruising. On the other hand, um, um, it can create more of a seroma, which I find, um, like I said, for, for Vasers, I use a drink more aggressively. So uh, there's pros and cons, I'll say, I'll, I'll leave it as neutral. What are your thoughts on ab boards, actually? Um, I think the benefit of the ab board, it's actually a great question, because they help. After you liposuction, the belly, you leave, you sort of deflate the abdominal skin, and people have a tendency to slouch. When you slouch, you, you fold your abdominal skin, and you get these horizontal lines. The ab board acts like a board that holds you up in kind of almost hyperextension, so you're not slouching, and your abdominal skin stays flat. So... People that had um, that had liposuction in the abdomen and had a had a, like a skinny layer left behind definitely higher than the ab board. Did you use ab board? Oh yes, I I actually use the <laughs> surgeon made ab board. It's so mm -hmm. comfortable, and uh, it keeps me so so flat. It's crazy. It helped me a lot during my recovery. So skinnier patients, people that have more aggressive liposuction on the belly, definitely recommend that you get just an ab board. And remember the purpose of this, it's, it's to help you stay straight. So, you know, it, it, there's no up board is gonna prevent you completely from slouching. It's just mm. your mind kind of digs into you. Stay straight, don't slouch because you will get these horizontal lines. Uh, are you allowed to use vibrating massage in the first few weeks? Absolutely. Uh, vibration is good. Um, best thing always, uh, look up somebody who is knowledgeable in post-op lipo massage. So they know what they're, what they're doing. Question, is it true that after a couple of lipos you may develop fibrosis and additional lipo may be hard to perform because of scar tissue? Absolutely, after every lipo, every time you go back, you have more and more fibrotic tissue. And sometimes it may feel soft, it may feel like you know what's left behind is, is fat, but once I go in there, I find it became really, really hard. I had a patient recently, a couple of months ago, who had what looked like residual fat left behind. <clears throat> so I went in, I tried the liposuction, I could not, it was hard like a rock. It was scar tissue, so we had to abort scar tissue, you cannot liposuction. You can potentially cut it out, stretch it out with surgical approach, but not liposuction itself. What can you do for fibrosis? Is there 
massage. Get on it quickly before it becomes solidified. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of massage. Once it becomes a hard, solid scalp pump, uh, you can try to melt it or soften it with uh, steroid injections like Kenalog injections. So sometimes okay. it's simple injections and that's what they're for. Question, is it hard to do a BBL procedure for people with tight skin? So that's a great question. Um, if your butt is tight, if you have a tight skin, understand that no matter how much fat I'm gonna inject in there, it's just not gonna stretch out. Think of it as, as a leather bag. Uh, and you're injecting jello. You're gonna inject lots of jello until the bag is full. Once it's full, the more jello you inject, it'll just squirt out. It's just not gonna stretch out this really, really tight bag. And I've spoken about this many times before. Um, I have uh, I put out some of these little instruct educational videos trying to explain what's happening. You have a muscle layer, then you have the fatty layer, then there's skin. Between the skin and the muscle, it's not just fat, but there's little fibers that are holding things together. And these fibers are really tight. So when they collapse, you can expand this, but once they become tight, you, you can't expand anymore unless you break them. And if you break them, you can get what's called a blowout, which is a horrible complication. So I try not to do that. So guys, if I have a chance to answer your question or get a question for a patient here, please send us a DM and I'll do my best to answer you each. Uh, check out her pictures. You get to see what she posted pictures of before and now, and you see the transformation. And these are real. This is not Photoshop. This is real surgery. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for sharing your experience with us. All right. Thanks. Have a good day. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.